hello. Looks like we're froze up already. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, this is the Uptown Tonight podcast. So if it wasn't held up by duct tape, you know, I don't know what would be going on. There we go. And now we're moving around. All right. Welcome to the Uptown Tonight podcast. Today is June 16th of 2021. It's been a great day today so far. You know, it almost looked like it was going to rain and then it didn't. But, you know. I've been working on a golf course for the past few weeks, and it's that's been really, actually, a lot of fun again. I did that years ago, along with our guest today, Mr. Russ. That's right. Russ Pfaff, yes. And, no, so getting the free golf and stuff along with that, I, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining at all. Just the early mornings. But <laughs> today, I'd like to talk to you a little more about uh, the pie, enlarging the pie and helping each other out. Cause I, you know, I was trying going into this last week and it was a little bit kind of convoluted. And I was explaining to you, my guy, Mr. Lewis Rossman, who does all the MacBook board repairs and all that other fun stuff. But this is pretty, pretty much what I'm trying to get at is like, he will explain to you and in perfect detail and in very, you know, just down to the wire detail. Well, it has to be down the wire. Huh? How to fix macbooks at least if they can be fixed and he spreads that out to everybody now he wants everyone to know this stuff why it's not because it's going to take work away from him but it basically it kind of lets everybody else know that if they can do this and in a way that other people start to trust them with it that this well whole industry will start to expand a little bit because basically if you bring your two thousand dollar computer into someone they're going to start you know putting a bunch of heat and you know pulling things off this guy right here the motherboard or the logic board for those apple fans out there and you're probably going to be a little nervous you're probably not going to really trust what's going on and if things don't go or things go south it's probably gonna you know that whole industry is just going to collapse on itself kind of the same here is that not saying that uh you know we all make bad music or bad entertainment and it's going to collapse on itself but we want to sit there and like basically tell everyone how good the entertainment is out there to get people out there and seeing it again not just sitting on their computers and watching netflix and all that other fun stuff getting them back out to see live entertainment and that's really what this is kind of about so man we have a perfect example of that from this last weekend we're out playing finley days and that was a lot of fun i used to teach out of finley for a long time well that was a while ago now, and not for a long time, but I used to teach out there. It was just a lot of fun seeing everybody again and all that. But uh, we found out that we got that gig by Mr. Sean Mitzel. Sean Mitzel from myself, Cito, Peter, and Brady. We thank you immensely for giving us the, or telling them that we're probably the band that they want to see. So thank you very much for that, Sean. So that's part of what's actually what this is all about. Just in there helping each other out and getting this thing, just getting it going. All right. And before we get started here today, we do have a birthday today. Mr. Rick Adams. Happy birthday, Rick. I was, I thought that was pretty fun to see there today. And then thank you again, Susie, for Susie's Weekly Entertainment Report. She always has that out. So look for that on Facebook as well. She has a whole bunch of things that are going on out there, at least in the area, and even further, further out. All right, so we have Mr. Russ today. How you doing, Russ? Doing really it's well. It's been a long time. Yeah, man. Now, I remembered when he first came into town, I, I'm not going to date ourselves here, but, you know, <laughs> you were such a youngin' back then, Yeah. and you came in from, where did you come from again? I grew up in Appleton, Minnesota. Appleton, Minnesota, and where is that by? Uh, it's south of Moorhead, about two hours. Two hours. So it's not really by anything. <laughs> <laughs> so that's closer to the cities than it is to here, right? No. Well, no. No, it's not really. Just straight. out in the middle of nowhere. Yep. Because I'm it's like close to. The I'm south just having Dakota trouble border. picturing where Appleton, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Appleton. Like, Minnesota. do you know where Wilmer is? Wilmer. Yeah. Kind of. It's yeah. like straight west of Wilmer. Oh man, how many people are in there? That town. Uh, like 1,500 right now. 1,500. And what were your parents doing there? How did you end up were growing up there? Well, my dad, when I was very young, had, he was, owned a pharmacy. He was a pharmacist. Oh, very nice. So he had, uh, he had that going on. And so he was the just, big pharmacist in town there. Yeah. Kind of, that was his business. Yep. Okay. And that's where you grew up, correct? Yeah. Well, oh. I grew up on a farm uh, a little bit north of there for until like 10th grade, and then we moved into town. Okay, so yeah, pretty rural. This is it kind of a farmstead <laughs> thing, or did you actually like farm farm? Well, my dad helped my grandpa farm, but 
we, I wouldn't call. I don't think we were ever really farmers. Oh, okay. We just lived so on didn't have you out doing chores? No. <laughs> Milking the cows and feeding no, the hogs. No, I just mowed the grass. That's about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> just mowed the grass, <laughs> <laughs> which will feed into something else later. So yeah. you, you grew up there, and then tenth grade you moved into town. Now you graduated from there, didn't you? Yep, Lackoparl was... Valley High School. Okay, I was going to say that doesn't sound like you have a high school there. Literally in the middle of a cornfield. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Is that kind of a con- consolidation? Then you have other schools or yeah. school districts that yeah, you know... it was like three three major town major towns. <laughs> uh, it was just a bunch of small towns that combined to have like one viable high school. Well, that's nice. Yeah. So what did you do while you were in high school then? Well, like you mean other than school? Well, obviously. yeah. Um, There's activities. I'm sure it's a smaller town. I wasn't really into sports. Uh, we did the jazz band thing. Okay. Uh, and then uh, me and some buddies put together a band and just played a lot of played a lot of drums. You had Skated a band. Around you put town. together a band in that kind of, that small of a yeah. town. Oh. Yeah, it was uh, it was called Meal. Me- nice. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it was really fun. Like a bunch of dudes from Appleton. Um, we had a crazy good rehearsal spot because like it was in the basement of the, like one of the churches in town had this like school building. So we had this huge room in the basement of that, like cable TV, like a, a pop cooler. It was crazy. But yeah, we did a bunch of like classic rock covers and Smashing Pumpkins and Weezer and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Did you guys ever actually play out anywhere besides... We played, like, the county fair and stuff like that. Oh, very uh, nice. Not too many gigs. We did one, uh, like, a school dance once that was kind of a failure. That's but that's still we giving you the opportunity to do We weren't that. really the, the right group for that kind of thing. Ah, we had never. <laughs> I got stories about uh, me and my younger brother... When you used to have long hair and stuff, and we were playing, uh, it was the church, uh, what am I thinking of here? It was a church talent show, but we're playing that, and he's standing there, full black, Metallica t-shirt, he's got the big old Explorer guitar, one just like James Hetfield, (laughs) and he's holding an old duels, and we're hanging out in the church. So, you know, it was the perfect, like, metal vibe from (laughs) the late 80s and all that, but, you know... Probably not the area where we should have been in that church. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's just how it is. So when did you start uh, playing with these guys? And we're like 12, 13 when you started playing? It was, we got that going right about the same time we moved to town. So 10th grade would have been, you said you didn't want to age us, but it was like 1998 when we started doing that. Um so I don't remember, like 16, 15, 16 years 15, old. 15, 16. How long have you been playing drums about at that point? Uh, I started in fifth grade playing the kit. So, <laughs> Just playing the kit, or was it uh, you go through the whole band process? Well, so I was, like, fifth grade is when you can, like, join band. Okay. And I was doing the whole thing where, like, I, I picked percussion as my instrument, and I was really struggling with anything with notes. Like reading music and me just don't work together. Oh, interesting. So I never my, would have figured that with you, but yeah, my band instructor was cool, and he just he said, "Well, you're really struggling playing this bell part. Why don't we just forget about that? Sit down at the kit here. You know, this is fifth grade. Never sat at a kit before, and so I sat down at the kit, and he put on. I wish I could remember the record, but he just put on a record and said, "Play what you hear." Was it like an actual record record? Or yeah. Like, oh, nice. That is awesome. And <laughs> he's just like. Town listen and play along and i just did it naturally and like that's like the only drum lesson i've ever really had on oh the kid. wow <laughs> from there that's all i ever did like after that it was like he's like take this drum set home this is your thing now so i just went home and i would just put on tapes and play along the old cassette tapes yep. that's, oh, yeah. that's how i learned so, yeah mr elbers shout out Listen to Mr. Elberson. Um, <laughs> he did an awesome job. Yeah. This guy. <laughs> Just being encouraging and understanding that uh, if somebody's struggling with something, it's instead of trying to like force it to just find something else that will work, you know? Yeah. And I think it did work kind of well in your favor <laughs> there. <laughs> You've been yeah. around doing a lot of that stuff. So that's cool. So what were the first stuff uh, influences then while you're you're learning this stuff? Did you just pick up the old uh, Blink-182 or whatever? I don't, well, I don't even think they existed then. But... Yeah, well, I'm just done. I'm throwing something out yeah. there. Come no, on, it was, it was a lot of Led Zeppelin. 
to be very honest. Oh, really? It's, Start off just listening yeah. to old Bonham, huh? Yep. Um, I had all the tapes. So a lot of that. And uh, oh, I'm trying you to had remember. all the tapes before all this? E- yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So there's had to be some influence there about music. Yeah. My dad had a, a pretty substantial classic rock like record collection. So we listen to that all the time. Okay. I probably wore out his copy of Inagata De Vita. Um, back before I started. I Ron Butterfly. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, but yeah, he had like the Woodstock albums and like all that stuff. Yardbirds. So you grew up just listening to all this yep. stuff. Well, that's great. I grew up listening to classic country and the polka party. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't listen to a lot of country in my house. <laughs> But I, I, I would my, think it'd be a blessing, but that yeah, one, man, and there's some good stuff. Maybe I'm out stepping there too. on my own toes. <laughs> <laughs> but I found my own way into like hip hop too, so that became a huge influence. Like the old Beastie Boys records. There we go. Um, and just like because they sampled all those classic rock albums, right? Like, yeah, exactly. If you listen to that stuff. There's Led Zeppelin samples in there somehow. You know, um, so hearing how Shh. how they yeah, <laughs> I'm giving away their secrets. <laughs> But hearing how they would take that music and chop it up and make it something else like that, that was a huge influence for me too. Um, that I, you know, I'm not really doing a lot of that in any of my groups right now, but um, it's something that I have done in the past and other groups is like tried to play like that. Like used, used the, the snippets of audio that I'm creating and try to repeat them like a DJ. That's okay. Something that I've tried to do in the past. But... Just physically on drums, analog right. bar. Okay. So you maybe is that a way that you just analyze the music and all that? Is that how you get so analytical with that stuff? <laughs> Probably. Oh. Yeah. I don't I don't really know. Like I've never really had a method. I've never really it just made sense. practiced anything <laughs> intentionally or anything like that. It's just I listen to things and make them my own. It just made sense. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, that's where I get jealous from because everything <laughs> that I had to learn, I I had to figure out down to the brass tacks. Like, why yeah. is, why does this work <laughs> before it actually worked for me? No, that's cool. All right, so what's the name of that group? I forgot already. The high school band. Yeah, Meal. 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 Yeah, the, we the... should start like a list of all these band names if everyone comes <laughs> in with because I there's, <laughs> just get so the the I singer, won't say ridiculous, but they're just awesome. <laughs> the singer had a like this thing with words with two meanings. So like you can eat a meal or something yeah. can be mealy. Yep. And like he would write whole entire original songs like that. Like we had, we well it was yeah it was Meal that wrote a song called Axis Lust, that was a, a love song but all the lyrics were about like Nazi, World War Two stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's <was> really crazy. <laughs> we actually wrote some pretty cool songs back then. I don't know where any of them are anymore. I probably have them on my computer somewhere. Oh, that'd be cool to hear some of those. Yeah, I should send you some of that stuff. Yeah, you should. (laughs) Yes, you should. (laughs) All right, so then you got past all that, and then you ended up at NDSU. Yep. That's where I met you at. Yep. How did you end up at NDSU? Was it just sort of like convenience, or was it a... No, it was um, from a very young age, I was pretty talented at drawing, especially buildings. Yes. So uh, everybody told me that I needed to be an architect and it was just kind of predestined that I would go to NDSU because it was nearby and they had a good architecture program. Oh, so, okay. So that's why I showed up at NDSU and then um, <laughs> was doing all the extracurricular stuff like marching band where we met. Yep. Exactly. And you're instructing that. Um, yeah. And then I did the jazz ensemble and um, the small group jazz combo and all that stuff. Combo. Yeah, but my, uh, my, uh, what do they call it? The person who like looks at your schedule and can't think of the name of it. Advisor. There we go. I uh, he thought I was well. crazy. He's like, you're, you're going to be an architecture major, but you're also going to do all this music stuff, you know? And then they called you crazy. Yeah. He thought I was nuts. <laughs> yeah, it worked out. I do more of that than I do architecture. <laughs> yeah, prove that I was right. <laughs> nah, he he made a good point. You know, it was I was taking like twenty one credits um, as an architecture major, which is pretty. That's it's a lot. That's exciting. I I won't say it. <laughs> but, yeah, it's a little beyond crazy. Yeah. <laughs> But I don't know. It, so how long did you do the 21 credit thing then? Did you just do a couple pretty of Pretty much semest- every semester. Until, Are you kidding? Uh, until oh my, my fifth year. Until you- 
Yeah. It was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, it was uncomfortable. But. No, it was, it was good. Um, my freshman year, um, tried out for the jazz ensemble, which is like the upper tier. That was by accident. Jazz <laughs> <Yeah>. group. <laughs> yeah. Um, and as a, it, like, it's just like bragging a little bit or whatever, but I, it's just a fun story for me because, um, I tried out and like, there were a bunch of like percussion music majors that also tried out. Oh, I and, bet. And I beat them out for the spot as a freshman architecture major. I said, so, you have something there. <laughs> so um, was it Mr. Endel? Hmm? Your music teacher. Uh, Elbers. Elbers. Yeah. Why was I thinking Andal? Elbers. Mr. Elbers again. <laughs> Good pick. Good pick. Yeah. <laughs> so I should have known then that I should have just switched majors, I think. But oh, Again, I can't read yeah. music, so it's a problem. See, that, that surprises me because I've been watching you from back in those days, and you just never had a problem with anything. It's, just, it's always just worked. Yeah. I, it's and, like drum charts I can read. That's just... But like seeing music and like making that work on a piano just there's no way like it would take me forever to figure out how to play it and the only way i would ever be able to play something on a instrument with actual notes would be if i memorized it yep okay yeah it's <laughs> it just doesn't work now it brings me to that. I'm just going to go straight to equipment here just because. Okay. And then I tried finding the photo, but this guy, um, his setup at one time, I don't know, like he had 12 left foot pedals <laughs> on his drum set. And I can't uh, remember the name of the group he was doing this with, but it was just completely, completely ridiculous. So there's something else going on up in that brain of his that I, I can't comprehend. I don't know how and why you would need all that extra stuff on there. Well, I know the Y parks. Yeah, it's toys. That'd be kind of fun. But yeah. I mean, just how you incorporate it all and then just actually like make it useful instead of just most people. Well, just, we buy a whole bunch of fun stuff, throw it on the kit to make it look really cool and big and bad. But, you know, you might touch it once and that's by accident, you know. Right. So. No, that, that band, I, I know exactly the picture you're talking about. Yep. It's, we were setting up to rehearse. Uh, that band was called Beat Down. Beat down, that's it. Yeah. That was that was with uh, a great bass player who isn't in the area anymore. He moved out west. His name was Caleb Mott. Yep, Caleb. Uh, Chris Gould was playing Hammond organ, Wurlitzer, and Rhodes piano. Uh, Ed Schwind, great alto sax player. Yeah. And then uh, Josh Maynard uh, on guitars, who was Ed and Josh were also later in um, Hell in a Handbasket. Nice. But yeah, that that setup with the pedals was. Um, so one of them was the, the slave side of the double kick pedal, of course. Yep. And I know you had the uh, remote hat. Yep, a, re a cable hat that went over to the right that had a 16-inch a crash cymbal upside down. And then on top of that was a 20-inch china with six rivets in it. It's <laughs> so beautiful. Uh, the next one over is just the regular hi-hat yeah. stand with my 13-inch new beats. And then the, the furthest left one is a cowbell. So... <laughs> Yeah, it all, I mean, so you kept that all, kids. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it was a lot of stuff to set up, but that band was playing like ridiculous funk fusion tunes and like originals that just had crazy instrumentation. And my idea with that band was that I wanted my kit to be basically two kits smashed together, and I had that except I only had one kick drum, but I had two hi hats, two rides, two snares. So you can basically just change your sound right on the fly. On the fly, I could switch all my hands to different instruments, and it would sound like a completely different kit. Um, I didn't like. I always wanted to add like a Dave Weckl style kind of like remote bass drum and have an eighteen. So did you I have just, two snares on there then too? Yeah. yeah, I played my. I had my fourteen inch Pacific, and then side snare was a twelve inch, twelve by three inch hammered steel Tama. No, close yeah. to a popcorn, but not yeah. quite. Yeah. <laughs> And then I don't know if it's in any of those pictures, but I was also in that band playing a 18 inch Roto Tom. Oh, that's right. Tuned you still gonna like sell me one of those Roto Toms? I still have two of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've moved them like four times now. But yeah, we had that thing tuned like as low as it would go, and mic'd up with a kick drum mic. There we go. And uh, we played a gig at Dempsey's once, and they actually 
we were sound checking and somebody came up and said, Hey, you, whatever that thing is, you got to turn it down. Cause you're rattling the Jameson bottles off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, turn it down. Uh, no, that was fun. That was a fun band. I missed that. Those were, those were crazy, crazy gigs. Just like having, having all that gear and, and being in a band that like required it was really crazy yeah it is but you have all that gear what do you have like 18 ride symbols and everything else you just kind of yeah, choose like, your flavor for the yeah, day and go like for nine, it yeah. i think right now i'm still using the same ride symbol i bought in 1992 <laughs> you know <laughs> she does me well but yeah yeah uh, no, we got the crash of, of doom too i know we're just geeking out here so yeah. we probably should get back to something everyone can actually <laughs> talk about but <laughs> no buying gear is a it's a disease it a is bit. like during the pandemic i bought another kit i bought like four snare drums Symbols only four. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. <laughs> you only got. Oh, I'm kidding. Not gonna go with that. <laughs> all right, so let's bring you back to NDSU. So, okay, so you made it through all that. Five years, twenty-one credits a semester. Uh, yeah, thank you for still being here. That's yeah. all I'm gonna say. And uh, so, what happened after that? You just were you joining bands during college or after college or how did you fall into during, that entire group? Yeah, during college we we formed um, Patents Pending. Which was the... I remember like, that. It was... A, I mean, if you went back... So Patent Spending later turned into Hell in a Handbasket, which is uh, a band that kind of quit recently. But um, through the years, there's been like 40 people in those two bands. Um, but the original two members of Patent Spending are me and Chris Hansen. Um, everybody else has kind of filtered through. And Chris, if you're watching out there, hi. And that <laughs> group was awesome. It still is. I hope it comes back. Yeah. You know, it's one of those horn bands that you just yep. want to see come around again. Yeah, but we, we put patent spending together. All of us were, like, really into, uh, like, Real Big Fish. Uh, but also, <laughs> like, Wallace Hartley, which some local people might know about. Um, Wallace, Wallace Hartley, Hartley and the, the Titanics. Titanics. Yeah. yeah, I think it was the first live show i ever seen. Yeah, so we, ever, ever. like... I discovered them through those guys who had been in the area and I was like, we should, you know, this would be great to do something like this. So we put that band together with the horns and everything and learned a bunch of covers and started playing gigs uh, and did it all through college. Nice. Remember your first gig? First gig with, oh man. With patents pending. I don't, the first one I can remember was at the NDSU music building for some sort of Okay, some Battle of the Bands type thing. Yeah, it was like a, it was in the foyer of the oh. music building for some, I don't remember what it was for, but that's yeah. the first one I can remember, I guess. But yeah, we did, we like, we were like the house band at the Empire for a while. The Empire? Yeah, that's very have, interesting. They used to have bands on Thursdays. <clears throat> we played there like five weeks in a row. Nice. It was ridiculous. We actually, uh, at that point, Al Berg was in the band. You know Al? Name's familiar. He plays... Primarily, well, like any keyboard. Well, I mean, he plays trombone and guitar and bass and probably drums and kazoo. I don't know. The dude's a savant. But nice. Um, so sorry, Al, if I have met you. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was playing keyboards in patent spending. Okay. And we decided that it would be a good idea, or he decided it would be a good idea to bring in <laughs> a Hammond C C three. I think he had a C3 at that point and a giant Leslie. Oh, the action. The, like the real thing. And the only way we could now, get him in. Now, was that the one that was in the back of 222 for a while? No. Did someone have a so. Hammond back there? I don't think so. I saw one. There was one back there, though. But the only way we could get it in there was through the liquor store. <laughs> Because we couldn't get it in either door of the bar, so we had to. And you guys had to haul that uh, thing in and out. And you know how it is when you're 20, whatever years old. Like, oh yeah, this is a great idea. Yeah. Now nobody would ever do that. <laughs> Way too old for that. But yeah, patent spending. Um, that was pretty much it. Well, no, that's not true. I was in another band called Doctor Hodgepodge, and that's actually where I met Josh, who was later in Beatdown and then okay. Hell in a Handbasket. Um, Doctor Hodgepodge was like it was a four piece band. Um, and we, it was just like a hippie jam band and it was super fun. Okay. Just, we did like some covers, but our show was primarily all originals. Uh, we have a 14 track album somewhere. It's not really for sale anywhere, but I have, I have a couple copies somewhere. Nice. We recorded it in two days. <laughs> I don't recommend 14 tracks in two days. It was, oh. it was not a good time. 
definitely would get your workout for you yeah there but yeah that was a that was a really fun band too and that's that's what kind of got me into jam bands before that i never really listened to any of that music like maybe a little bit of like the radio almond brothers stuff but joining a jam band or forming a jam band like made me get into that stuff so that's when i that's when i kind of got into like ween oh man. or like umphreys mcgee yep you know bands like that where they're just jamming you know like those bands could play an hour set and play some like play nothing that you've ever heard before oh exactly like that's why fish, i stopped fish you know? yeah. down in i think it was in madison wisconsin and we drove all well it wasn't all night but it felt like all night <laughs> that was the first place someone that just actively in public tried to uh get me to buy drugs from them. I, I don't know being from fargo we didn't really have that problem right <laughs> it's just kind of weird yeah and then the the lady next to us, a little girl, that was like her forty eighth fish concert in a row or something like that. It was just ridiculous, but that's crazy. I don't know. To me, I didn't find it too interesting, just because it just seemed like everything just droned on. The light show was phenomenal. Right, that, right. That was killer. And it just all went along with what the music was, and that's right. when you knew where the high points were and everything else. That was really cool. Yeah, it was being in a band like that where you're basically just you have like outlines of tunes. Yep. But then you get up on stage and you have your 45 minute set or whatever opening for so and so from wherever. And we would just be like, well, here's our set list, but let's go. just <laughs> go play, you know. And it, 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 we might get through three of those songs just because there's solos and just big jam sections and stuff like that. Exactly. I miss that stuff too. Oh, that's fun. It gets the creative juices moving, yeah. especially on the spot. You can't stop, <laughs> keep on going. So you went from there, and then uh, where did Hell in a Handbasket come from? And uh, we have links for that down below again, too, because yeah. uh, they've got a lot of videos on stuff. Good stuff, so go check that out. Yeah, there's a little bit kind of trickling into YouTube. I have terabytes, like actual terabytes of video and audio oh for that band. Gosh. Multi-track audio recordings. Yeah, you're the first one that got me into GoPros, so yeah. they started doing that stuff, too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... Um, trying to think of the timeline. I graduated from college in 05... Um, left town for a few months and then came back that summer. Uh, we got patents pending back together and started gigging again a little bit. And then 2000, I want to say 2007, but I can't, I can't remember exactly. They've been going on for that long. Yeah. Huh? Well, so we got, we well. formed patents pending in like 2002. Okay. So it's, so it's almost two decades years. worth. Uh, oh. Um, but yeah, so I came back, we started playing as patents pending again, and then I don't want to blame anybody, but um, somewhere in there, um, post-traumatic funk syndrome started doing their thing. Yep. And they were doing, like our set lists were very similar at that point. We had a little bit of the punk ska sprinkled in there, and they weren't really doing that. They were just doing like the good old, you know, funk horn band stuff. Yep. Um, and... You know, we we started to see some gigs go away, and um, kind of uh, we lost a, we lost Al to that band, uh, oh, which was kind of okay. the, the catalyst of um, okay, we need to change what we're doing here. We don't have a keyboard player anymore. We still have the horn section, so we decided at that point to end patents pending and start a band that was more focused on like party music. So we we like shifted to doing a lot more ska stuff and just like 90s pop punk and um more upbeat classic rock covers and stuff like that there you go and it worked out really well um we just learned a bunch of new tunes and started booking gigs we actually transitioned i wish i could remember what year it was but uh we played a new year's eve show at the parrot and we we played up until midnight as patents pending and then switched to hell in a hand basket at midnight oh my <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, cool. that is awesome i never even knew that yep <laughs> and then from then on year to come on <laughs> yeah, and then we, we played just, like most bands do we, we got busier and busier and better and better <laughs> yeah um people came in in and out of the band as time went by and then we eventually kind of settled on a really core group that stayed stable for a lot of years um the addition of bill dablo Yep. who you may know as Billy D from Billy D and the Crystals. Oh, okay. Um, he was a really good addition to the band. He he kind of took the the whole stage show to a different level. A lot of charisma, a lot of 
um, crowd interaction that we were lacking um, because not to say anything bad about Chris and Ed as front men, but they were, they were also playing instruments in the band and it's hard to be like a true front man when you're holding a bass or a sax. Right. So getting a, getting a guy in there that was uh, just a front man, not just a front man, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like and he, has the experience he was and all the that. Singer, he in. was the guy. Um, yeah. And tons of experience. Billy Dean, the crystals from the seventies or whatever, you know, he's been doing it forever. Yeah. Uh, but, we, you know, eight people in the band, um, people get older, people have kids. So the it got harder and harder to get together Responsibilities, for rehearsal. Responsibilities, yeah, man. I know, so lame. <laughs> but, you know, it, it got harder and harder to book gigs and everything. So it, it started to dwindle. And uh, we kind of collectively as a group decided to just stop because – the future I saw was less and less gigs and probably no rehearsals. And I wanted the band to just be good and end on that instead of just trying to play like two shows a year or something like that. And every show getting worse and worse until it's just not fun anymore. So that was my mentality. Anyway, other people in the band might have different ideas. No, that makes perfect sense. And just beating it until it's, yeah, it's like hates each other. You know, we, we were, we went out on a high note. (laughs) Exactly. So, and we had four really good shows leading up to uh, new year's Eve, 2018, 19. And we played at Dempsey's and that was the last show. Yeah. It was perfect timing on all that too, considering what just happened. (laughs) So yeah, that's good. It was cool too. Cause like our, Hell in a Handbasket became a band at midnight on New Year's Eve and whatever year it was, and our last show was a New Year's Eve show. So it was like exactly that many years. Came full circle. <laughs> yeah. No, that's beautiful. Yeah. So how did you get into the Gina Powers band then? Uh, that was like the kind of the same time that Helena kind of decided to hang it up. Okay. I became more available. So um, I was doing this thing... I uh, can't remember what it's called. We play in Fargo that this guy Julian put together. He's at the time he was living in California. He lives in Michigan now. Okay. Uh, he came up here and he wanted to put together like a world record breaking ukulele performance and then do like this nonstop 72 hour jam session thing. Okay. World record breaking ukulele. If we got to stop there, what's going on? <laughs> like he, you were talking about just time wise or yeah, what's going time on? like nonstop for, I don't remember how many hours it was. Like oh, 40, five hours or something like that did they make it yeah he made it oh. it was solo <laughs> okay and he apparently he had done a jam session right afterwards like late like the next weekend oh yeah, okay he started the jam session on like bleeding. A, yeah. <laughs> that's what i was immediately thinking, after like, like no break straight into the callus is three inches thick <laughs> but as part of that he also wanted to record like a, a 10 track album using local musicians so uh the studio where that happened was uh below ground studios in moorhead Okay. Which happened to be like within a golf ball drive of my front door. Oh, okay. So I could just walk up there. So I like if you get your hands on a copy of that album, I'm on like 10 of the 14 tracks or whatever it is. Nice. Just because I was there all the time. Um, but uh, as part of that, like Gina was there for something. I don't think I played anything with her on that. But she eventually asked Julian, like, hey, did you meet any drummers? while you were here because for whatever reason they were looking to switch up their drummer thing and she he gave her my information and she contacted me and history i guess so and they just kept on going huh yeah okay yeah so i joined that band and then shortly after i had an opportunity to join hardwood groove out of dl yep um which we're not really sure what's going on with Hardwood Groove right now, but we haven't played. We haven't even been together as a group of people since 2019. Okay. Like, uh, the pandemic hit that band real hard. Um, so we're kind of trying to figure out what's going on there, but Gina Powers Band is doing really good work right now. Yep, got a lot of gigs through. booked. We've got an album to promote, or an LP, I guess, EP, whatever you call it, six tracks. EP? Yeah. Um, which we yeah. recorded in January of 2020. And then, you know, the world ended. <laughs> so, so it's January 2020. It is now June of 2021. That uh, that dropped like two weeks ago, right? Or my we you know, no, we started releasing tracks a while back. 
uh, there's a video that got put out not too long ago that you might be thinking of. Yeah, How's this go video? That's like a we pushed a promo video for you guys on here a couple times. Yeah. Well, I don't. We haven't really dropped the album yet. Oh, we had an really? we had an album release show at one of the live at Livewire things. Yeah. Uh, they got cut short because the cops decided to tear gas the protesters for George Floyd oh. that night. So the, the yeah. it's such weird times. The EP is just like cursed. okay. So you got to give that story. But first off, let's let's just hang on here for a second. <laughs> let's find out what else is going on out there. So Cino, what's going on out in hey, the old Fargo How's it going? Uh, thanks, Wade, for giving me that. Uh, this is the Uptown Report with Cito. Uh, what we got going on here is the Windbreak. Rhyme of Reasons out there Thursday. Our band Uptown will be back there on Friday night, and then Frantic Anarchy will be out there Saturday night. Frantic Anarchy. Yeah, Who's Frantic. That's a great name. Uh, <laughs> Shooting Star Casinos got drop tailgate Friday and Saturday, and the Tax Center has Frontline Fallout, Understudy, and uh, Gradients. Gradients? Yeah, Gradients. And, and he was Wednesday. one of our guests in here, yep. Uh, He's playing right now, basically. Oh, okay. What's going on right now? So, dee -dee 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 -dee, get out there. Uh, <laughs> Jesse Veter, uh, uh acoustic show is uh, Thursday over there at the, what is that? TB, Tebo? Tebo, yeah. TVbo. TVbo. I don't know what it that is. It very hip hop -y. We'll have to, We're going to have to look in that. We'll do some investigating on that. We'll get our reporter out there right away. <laughs> <laughs> Downtown, we got Dempsey's uh, uh, Aquin Signal uh, Friday night, and then Kicking Up Country in Carlstead. Uh, who's out there? I, I know who's out there. They, it's, uh, uh, I know Moon Dance has uh, the Slam of Bama. Yeah. I can't remember who's kicking up. And country. There's some acoustic people out there. Yeah, too. there was a I ton of remember. acoustic you know, we'll, we'll going on. We'll try to get an update on that. Uh, Moon Dance Jamming Country Fest Thursday, Saturday. Uh, that's the 17th, 19th. That's going to be out there. So make sure you, you get out there and get your tent popped up and keep the beer cold. Aquarium Shotgun Facelift. That's one of my favorite band names of all time. Shotgun yeah, we had John in here of that as yeah. well. Greg Hand Karma. Those guys are great too. Uh, let's see. Is that the same thing? Oh, yeah. Tyron yep. Sound uh, and Prophet Saturday night. The first Lutheran Church has the summer concert starting on Wednesday nights. Oh, yeah. They built that stage right on Broadway. That's pretty oh, cool. Oh, sweet. Make sure you check that out. Yeah, this will have food trucks and everything around there. Yeah. Down. I could, what do we got downtown? We got the Pub West, uh, Big and Hungry out there. It's Mike Holt. Uh, Thursday night in Silver Dollar Flying Pig, we got Jim White out there on Friday night. Edgewood Tavern, that's at the Edgewood Golf Course. Uh, that's South 26 on Thursday night. And then yeah. the Hillsborough Street Dance is having jacked up on Saturday night. Yep, so South 26, that's Reese and Jay's little uh, acoustic duo from oh, okay. the Irish Whiskey people. Nice. Uh, at Rookies, Mick Klein is out there on Friday night. Uh, VFW Fargo, we got the Divas and Rockstars uh, Friday and Saturday night. Big Irvs, we got the Johnny Holmes uh, street dance going out wow. there. And I know that uh, Zach, uh, Zach Johnson, or, yeah, it's, or, oh, man, I'm messing that up. <laughs> he's, he's opening out there for him. I'm sorry if I messed up here. Uh, I'm an idiot. Uh, O'Kelly's, Mike Morris is out there. And then Essentia Health Plaza, Brianna and Lars are going to be doing your acoustic thing on Thursday night out there. So... And then uh, that's it for the Uptown Report. Uh, thank you, Wade. I give it back to you. All right. So let's see. Tear gas, George Floyd, cut short. What hap What's going on here now? We have a so Gina we, Powers Gina Powers band, EP release party. Yeah, at the Live at Livewire. Remember when they were doing those things during the when nobody had shows? Yes. Livewire stepped up and like turned their warehouse into a kick-ass venue. Yes. With all their crazy gear and lights and everything. So uh, Gina Powers Band thought we would use that as an opportunity to do an EP release. Um, Makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, it was a great, great <laughs> venue for it. Um, you get the interaction through like the chat with people who are watching. And um, yeah, it was really cool. And I did multiple of those. I did one, I did a couple of them with Gina. I did one with the Crop Dusters. Um, yeah, it was really cool. But, yes. you know, yeah, we, uh, we decided, you know, whatever, whatever day it was, I think it was in May. I don't remember. It must have been in May. Um, to do our EP release, we had a bunch of guests kind of open and, and do duo and trio stuff with Gina, okay. um, like former band members and stuff like that. And then just kind of let it all up. And we had like video production and all this stuff kind of to interleave in between the acts. Nice. And then we got up there and 
we we did get to play the entire EP from cover to cover, and then play like a little bit of the rest of our set, and then we took a quick break, and they kind of came up to us and they said, "Hey, we've we've gotten word that they're about to gas the protesters, um, and their their spot is kind of near where that was happening." So so it was near Broadway. Yeah, it yeah, was on thing. like First Avenue there. <laughs> okay, yep. Yeah. Their live wires kind of in in that area. I don't want to give away exactly where they are because they kind of try to keep it hush hush but there it was it's close enough that they were concerned about that activity moving towards where we were and possibly interfering with us being able to leave so they said leave your gear here it'll be safe go home so they shut down the stream and we left and i went back in the morning and picked so up. can we find the stream to this day <laughs> Like, I did they think... say anything on shutting down the stream, or is he just kind of just cut it off? No, Gina it? Gina made a little announcement, kind of telling what was going on. It's not like they just killed it. Okay, so we were able to like wrap it. Then up. Then who a came bit. in and told you all this? Is like some Kent, kind of... the owner. The owner. Yeah. Okay, so there's like we're just gonna shut this down. So just in well, case, he, or... he kind of gave us an option, which was really cool. Um, but it was really obvious that everybody that was there didn't want to be there anymore. Ah, so, so it would have been really lock the doors and yeah, hope for the best. It would have been really selfish for us to say like, no, we're gonna finish this. So we just mm. like, yep, that's fine. <laughs> and it was probably yeah. the right choice. And I mean, we could have kept going and nothing would have happened. But you, you know, I mean, you don't know that at the time. Yeah, but still, that's a story you're gonna take yeah. for the rest of your life. That's just that, the, the world is. I've never been shut down man. because there were potential riot outside yeah <laughs> say that it's pretty wild i've been kicked out of the nester before while playing but that's a whole different story <laughs> that's anyway a, probably a great how story. does that happen all right well we need to have a little destruction here we gotta do so I, are you into juvenile destruction i am because all the parties that we used to have here back in the day and it was actually before i even met you yeah huh? Yeah, the whole thing was throwing stuff off the roof of the garage and seeing what happens. So here is our off the roof. Go. Go. And you may be asking, what is that? <laughs> idea it was just there it was like let's smash it okay let's see what yeah. happens if you don't know what it is <laughs> as well throw it off the roof i guess and again if you have any <laughs> donations you want to see thrown off the roof bring them on over we'll let you know where to go so you can find us on uptownbandfargo.com or you can email us at uptown tonight podcast at gmail.com or uptown band fargo uh, at gmail.com and Cito is smiling here for some reason. I just drive by Wade's place and just throw it in his yard. <laughs> you can do that as well. I don't. <laughs> I you don't discriminate. Next week you got a whole big pile of stuff. Yeah. We'll break it for you. And we won't even say your name unless you want us to. So we have all that. So anything left for the good of the order, there, sir? I don't know. No. Man. I mean, I you could... guys are playing this weekend, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Uh, sure. Friday. Friday. Yeah, I don't know. I have to look at my calendar. Friday at Friday. the. At, How did that uh, not get on my slide? I thought for certain I put two, that up there. Two tall Never tavern. And yeah, the Cushing. two tall tavern. Did you played there. How did we miss that? I know I put that in there, but oh well. Where was that? Cushing. Cushing. Have you yeah. played there? No, have not. Have you? I I looked up pictures of it. It looks really sick. Like there's a huge outdoor stage and like a big patio. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so that'll yeah, be cool. a great time then. Especially since our our last gig uh, was at um, Drum Conrath. Which I love that. I love that place. But playing in there is, it's a glass wall, concrete floor. <laughs> Lots of you know, reverberation. It, it, the drummer's got to be, you got to kind of keep it chill. <laughs> so it'll be it'll be fun to play like an outdoor show where we can slam and crank the PA up. 
Very nice. Yeah, so go check them out. We have links to the Gina Powers band down below as long as, uh, as well, I should say, as Hell in a Handbasket there. So all I have to say is if, if your drummer is more charisma than your front man, you know your band's in trouble. That's why mine's doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> so until next time. <laughs>